thank you all for being here. Um, and we've got a guest with us today. And, and then we're going to open this up. We've got quite a few folks on. We've got 45 people on. So we are going to keep you muted throughout the, the um, presentation. But in the end, type in your questions in the chat. We will get to those first. And then if you would, um, if you stay until the end, we'll go ahead and open up the, the mic and let you ask your questions there too. But let's let's try to be a little bit civil about this because we do have a lot of folks on the call. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is I know everybody's going, you know, so what are you doing now for us? We've been working very diligently to get the legislature to help restaurants. And I understand that, um, you know, you guys don't want to hand up. You just want to open. We have not found a way to get the governor to open up restaurants. That's it's just, as you know, it's it's an impossibility. Um, and so uh, with that being said, what we're doing now is we're asking the legislature for their help. Um, and what I need from you is this campaign has got to go to everybody you know. We have 75,000 employees in this industry. We've got about 30,000 of those are not um, working right now. And we need them to send this letter to their legislators. We need your suppliers to send this le letter to legislators. We need everybody in this industry to send this letter to legislators. We need them to know how important this industry is. Um, so here's, here's my, my plea to you. Um, you can, we will be sending this out to you in a, an email in the next two days. This is a campaign and you guys have done this before. And if you haven't, it's super simple. All you do is get onto the URL, type in your name, phone number, email, what business you own and send the email. I ask you though, to take a few moments to just type in some, type in your personal story, where you have your business and your personal story needs to go in here somewhere. And it's best if it goes in that first paragraph because they're gonna see this email a lot. And what they need to see is something personal from you. Super important that we do this because we need their help right now. Um, we have been doing uh, legislative town halls. We did three of them last week um, where we brought in legislators and talked about uh, the industry, some of our survey numbers. Um, some, some of this you guys don't even know. 52% of restaurants say it's unlikely their restaurant will be in business six months from now. Legislators need to know that. 47% of New Mexico restaurant operators say they're considering temporarily closing their restaurant until the pandemic passes. And the problem with closing your restaurant now is having the money to reopen when this does pass. So what we're going to the legislature and asking for is to get you grants, more grants, um, and to finally allow for alcohol delivery for some of you that matters and, um, and to stop charging us liquor license fees um, inspection fees, the fees that the government gets for allowing us to do business, which they have not allowed us to do in the last year. So um, those are just some of the things. If you want an, a more in-depth uh, presentation on that, I'd be happy to give it to you or just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You guys all know my email address is executive at nmrestaurants.org. And you're so welcome um, to email me. You're welcome to call me. Um, my, my staff goes crazy when I give out my cell phone number, but so far nobody's really um, abused that and, and I appreciate that and I, I do appreciate the calls. I need to hear from you. I need to hear what your situation is. So my cell phone number is 505-250-2911. Now, along with this letter that we're sending out, we're also asking you to post don't leave restaurants out in the cold. And, and this is something that you can put flyers on your takeout orders. You can give this to your customers. You can post it on your front door. Um, if you text out cold to 52886, 
they're going to get to this um, piece of information. So, so having said that, we want you to take a picture outside of your restaurant and say, don't leave restaurants out in the cold, um, hashtag out cold. And we'll, again, we'll put these and, uh, and everything else in an email to you. You won't miss it as long as you are on, on our email address. So thank you all for being here. And um, it is my pleasure now to bring you the program you came here for. And that is um, the, the latest, greatest payroll protection uh, program. We have Brad Beasley from Beasley Mitchell and Company here to talk to us about that. And Brad, I'm going to stop my share so you can start your share. Okay. Let's see, I will share the screen. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me, Carol. Really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Should be the, that. So what are we, uh, we're talking about today? Basically we're talking about uh, what everybody wants to talk about is the PPP2, or as they're calling it, the second draw on PPP. And, you know, this is, I, I feel, you know, since the last time we talked about, uh, talked with you guys, which I believe was in um, uh, late March, uh, early April, actually, uh, when we, when we had our discussion last time, all of us about these PPP loans, you know, there's a few things that we've gotten better at. One is that we're definitely better at Zoom uh, today than we have been in the past. Uh, and we're certainly better uh, at understanding a little bit of these PPP loans and, uh, and some of the issues around it. So I kind of feel like, so like that's why I put this one picture up, I kind of feel like it's back to the future, right? It's the same, a lot of the same concepts as we've had in the past under the old PPP loans. And now they're kind of applied in a new and and I, I will agree probably more targeted way, which which makes complete sense uh, for what we're trying to do. Uh, a couple things that you probably need to know, just because there's a few items that uh, Carol and, and the the uh, management team there, the restaurant association was we were talking about. You know, a lot of people receive those uh, New Mexico Finance Authority grants. Um, really like you to consider whether those um, are taxable income or not. Um, you know, we, we, we think they are. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it is a grant, but you're not a nonprofit, so it's not under the same rules. So that's where we need to kind of watch out a little bit. And it's not what my presentation's on. We're talking about PPP, but there's a lot of these issues that come up related to uh, uh, all these this different assistance that we're getting. And so just because we're getting this assistant and they call it a grant, which typically most people don't think that that's the case, you know, we, we really think that, uh, uh, that in this case, the NMFA grants and some of the state and local grants, like here in Las Cruces, there were city grants and there were county grants. We think those are, are taxable income. So, so uh, that's what the law would say. So absent some other thing to that, it's, it's going to be taxable income to you guys. So just, just watch out for that and uh, you know, make sure you're, you're doing your projections properly. So really kind of wanted to start with how do we get here, right? You know, we, we've been flying around uh, doing these PPP loans and trying to struggle with the, the COVID-19 and everything for almost a year now. And it's, remember, how did we get to what we know today, okay? Um, it started out with the March 27th, CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid and Relief Act. Then it was further corrected in March and April 24th with the PPP Health and Healthcare Enhancement Act. Then in 6520, we had the PPP Flexibility Act. And then followed up by the 122720 Consolidated Appropriations Act. So everybody calls this a, was calling this a coronavirus relief bill. It's not. It's, it's actually part of the government's appropriations uh, bill. And so basically the appropriations is where we're spending money, obviously, throughout the entire government. And so that's why some people are like, why is the foreign spending in the Coronavirus Act? Well, it's not. It's the Consolidated Appropriations Act. So there's a lot of spending that's not just directly related to coronavirus. Um, and so that's where it's related. So you say, okay, well, Brad, that's not that bad. I mean, that's four laws. 
Now remember the Consolidated Appropriations Act was 5,592 pages long, okay? So, um, you know, it's a, it's a big act. And so all these, these laws are, are, are very robust. And so they said, well, that's not that terrible, Brad, either. He said, yeah, but we also have all these. We have all these SBA regs. And you look at the regs that were issued, April 2nd, April 3rd, April 14th, April 24th, April 27th, 28th, 30th, and you can see on. Well, wait, that's, that's not all of them because we've also got May 20th, June 5th, June 10th, June 12th, June 17th, June 14th. So you can see that we have thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of information that we're trying to sift through and we all have to go through and make sure that we know all the information that's handled in all these different regs and they tend to keep building on each other. And so it's just a situation where uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of activities that you have to be aware of. So kind of what's in the Consolidated Appropriations Act, oh, we'll get to the PPP stuff. I just realized I spelled moratorium incorrectly on here. So there, change that. Um, the key non-PPP provisions, uh, they talked about the stimulus, you know, which is $600 per person or $1,200 for a family, uh, plus some money for each child that you get. Uh, it increases the $300 per week unemployment. It extends the national eviction moratorium, creates some transportation funding. And so that's, so there's a few pieces there. Also, it expands the food assistance program, the SNAP. And like I said, this was the picture of me when I saw in the Consolidated Appropriations Act that 100% deduction on all meals and entertainment. Uh, so as soon as we can get you guys out of the cold and we can actually dine in all of y'all's fancy, nice restaurants, we get to deduct all of our meals uh, in 2021 as opposed to just the normal 50%. Now this is gonna get a little tricky because we have the issue of entertainment being 0% deductible still. And so what I need you guys to make sure is that as you're providing me your meals, you are not entertaining me as well. So I just, I just wanna eat and, uh, and uh, uh, not be necessarily entertained because I, I don't wanna have to try to deal with allocating this de deduction between entertainment and meals. But I think this is a good provision for you guys. And and I'm very happy that they put this in. A um, little historical background, the reason why it's at 50%, uh, it's because we're greedy as American taxpayers. And if they allow us to take our meals, then we'll just have fancier meals. And so when they cut it back to 50, we saw the amount of meals go down. And so the government doesn't want to necessarily subsidize businesses for um, uh, fancy, you know, large meals, but like I so said, they've got back because they need, we need to get everybody out and eating in, in restaurants again. I, I, you know, I like this provision with the 100% uh, deduction of the meals. In addition to that, they made some clarifications and I think actually a really good clarification on the payroll tax credits. And so there's a, a flow chart I'm going to show you here next. It's a very busy flow chart but you have to kind of understand it before, if you took the PPP loan, you were not eligible for certain payroll tax credits. So for example, the, not necessarily the payroll relief credit, but the, uh, the sick leave credit, the CARES Act employee retention credit in relation to uh, your employees, you were not allowed to take it if you took PPP. Well, now you can actually take it. So I think a lot of you should really consider if you have, need to go back and amend your 941s for purpose, 940s and 9, or excuse me, your 941s to take advantage of this credit. And the only kicker on this credit is that just because somebody was working from home, and so this is what a lot of our clients are, are saying, well, I, I should get this credit. I sent everybody home. Yeah, but were they working from home? And the answer is, well, yeah, they were working from home. Well, then that's not part of this credit. This would be a situation where you have sent your servers home or your cooks home, and there was no requirement that they actually do work and you continued to pay them. That's where this credit would, uh, would, would come into play. Additionally, the credit is not allowed 
if you can't double dip here. So if you use that person's payroll, and here's why I talk about how busy this flowchart is. If you've used that person's payroll to satisfy the forgiveness of PPP, that payroll doesn't count towards this credit. But like a lot of you, you exhausted your PPP funds and expenses in July, August, maybe all the way even through September. Then maybe if you have people right now that you're paying to be at home, um, you know, then that would potentially qualify for this credit. So I would encourage you to spend a little bit of time. I will circulate the, uh, these two flow charts to the group uh, when we're done, because it's really super busy um, on, on the screen. And you can see like, you know, did we have a hundred or fewer employees? I don't, uh, no, we didn't. So, you know, so there's all these little flow charts that we have to get, get through for the, uh, the payroll tax credits. Um, Okay, so I actually, actually there's one question that popped up and I'm just kind of monitoring the questions as we're chatting. You know, how can grant the grant income under the, how can the grant be income under the anti-donation clause taxable to the IRS, but not New Mexico? Well, this is not a new concept. I mean, if you guys remember, you know, I, I, I feel like every day I start talking like my father where it's like, if you remember back in the day, if you were back under the Richardson administration when we were in New Mexico, here in New Mexico, where we had, the situation where we had a surplus of funds in the state and they wanted to give us a electrical utility rebate, right? I think because they felt we paid too much electricity bills. This was just a reason for them to give us money. And so they paid us all 250 bucks or something like that, 500 bucks. I forget the exact number. Uh, the problem was, is that was income. And we all had to report that as income. A lot of people didn't. IRS doesn't care what the state calls it. It is a source of income. So it's taxable to the IRS um, and, it's, and it's income. It, like I said, I, I, anti-donation clause, we've, we have, we, the, the, the state has moved past the anti-donation clause ship a long time ago in this coronavirus. There's so much that if somebody really wanted to get um, aggressive on anti-donation, there's probably a, a bunch of stuff that people could, could go after. Um, so I'm not necessarily gonna make any more comments than that on the anti-donation clause. But uh, like I said, it doesn't matter what the state calls it. You received income. I believe that is 100% uh, taxable uh, in that. So um, once again, it's not 100% uh, tax. It's, it's the only tax at whatever rate you're at. And uh, you know, so that's not terrible. Okay, so getting back to here, the uh, one part of the provision that, was the, that made me the happiest, and I think I actually have a picture of myself when I saw this part of the, the act come out, if you'll see it right here. That was me. Actually, that's Will Farrell. Under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the PPP expenses are now deductible. And you say, well, okay, Brad, I thought the stuff was an income. So you remember in the original act that funded the PPP, it said the income from PPP forgiveness is not considered income. And we get, that's great. You get to deduct it. I stood here and told you guys too that you're going to get to deduct it because that's exactly what the congressional intent was. And that's what all the knowledge base at that time said. Well, then the IRS, who has no heart, uh, came out and said, well, yeah, but that is considered tax exempt income. And as soon as they said tax exempt income to uh, us CPAs, we all went, oh, darn. So that's no different than when we had margin interest and you use margin interest interest to buy tax exempt income, part of that margin interest isn't deductible. So we knew where they were going on that. So I'm very glad that Congress came in and adjusted this because I will tell you, we ran a lot of projections for a lot of our clients. And part of the issue was, is that we had clients who had losses. Uh, and then once you added back the expenses that were not allowed from the PPP, they had income and they've spent a lot of their capital trying to stay afloat. So it's hard as a tax preparer to tell your client, I understand that you had a loss and I understand that, but you got to pay some tax. Well, that's, that's not super, super fun. And so I'm really glad that that happens. Now, little tricks in this one though, it's deductible. If you're later found 
found out that you should not have gotten the loan or part of this should not have gotten forgiven, then there's a reversal pr process. And so it's very, it gets very, very complicated. Um, you know, so uh, just keep, it, keep an eye out for, for all of that. And then I read more of the PPP provision and the deductibility section of the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And I said, what? Deductibility, and then we, now we have question marks. It went from excitement to questions as most things do. This gets very complicated from a tax standpoint. You have to understand how S corporations are taxed and how partnerships are taxed. In partnerships and in S corps, you have a concept called basis. I mean, the amount of money that you've put in plus the earnings of the entity minus the money that you've pulled out. Okay, money you put in plus the income minus the money that you've pulled out is your basis. This is considered tax exempt income. Um, it is not necessarily an increase to basis on this because in the law it actually says it's not a reduction of basis. And you go, well, that's weird. Why would it not be a reduction in basis? But it, they specifically put that in there so it's not necessarily an increase in basis. So where we're seeing this because of the way partnership law works and the way S corporation under subchapter K works is that if you're an S corp and you have a loss and you took the PPP and then you took and you paid yourself a distribution out of your S corp, you need to watch out. And I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to scare you, but you need to watch out because that money that you took out may be considered what's called a distribution in excess of basis, which for those of you that may know, that is considered taxable gain. So you would pay tax at a capital gain rate. We can get into long-term, short-term and all those different things. But it becomes a, a problem because not everything is gonna match up with this. And so uh, I, I, it's, it's still good. Everything is still pretty good. Just if you're an S Corp, to me, S Corps are the ones that are most vulnerable in this situation. I know a lot of you are S Corps because I know a lot of people don't like paying self-employment tax. So a lot of you are S Corps the ones that need to raise a super, super big red flag is if you used to be a C Corp, even if it was a long time ago, and you are now switching, and you have in the past now switched to and are currently an S Corp. Because if you now take a distribution, you say, oh, Brad, I, I still have equity. I, I took my S Corp distribution. But if you took the distribution and it was in excess of what's called your AAA, your accumulated adjustments account, now you actually have a taxable dividend in addition to distribution in excess of basis, a double whammy, Ugh, right? That's not very good. So super technical, but just wanted to, you know, have you guys have your ears perked up for uh, when, uh, you know, if, if this happens, okay? And you should take a look at this. Your, C, your CPA should know about this stuff, but once again, this is a real, real challenge. And we, you know, are, we're very conscious of our S corps uh, that are getting the PPP and the forgiveness because it, it, is, it is a problem. So I like calling it PPP too. I don't know why. I just think it's more fun. It sounds a lot better than the word that they use, which is called the second draw, right? I, so that's kind of where you know, I, I feel like that's like a Rambo movie, I guess I was watching last night. Rambo second draw, I don't know. But the as far as the PPP2, the nice part is that it is very, very, very identical to the first time around. So it is still a calculation with the average monthly payroll in a lot of very, very similar fashion. They've learned a lot more. So now you can actually just use, they've made it simpler to where now you can just use the average monthly payroll for 2019 to determine your loan amount. So that's a, a, lot, uh, a lot easier than all the rigmarole we all did back in March and April trying to figure this thing out. Or it is the average monthly payroll incurred within one year 
before the loan. So this is where you're gonna have to, if you've grown or expanded during this time, um, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? If you're in revenues down by 25%, but you grew, you know, I'm not sure how that's gonna work, but um, maybe you expanded, maybe you bought more restaurants or maybe you did, did something during that time uh, to allow you to do that. But basically it's, it's the same average monthly payroll for 2019 or average payroll within one year on which the loan is made. And payroll costs, same stuff, salaries, wages, tips, paid leave, healthcare payments, retirement benefits. It's still the same, very, very similar, similar stuff. Um, where we're working right now with a lot of the banks is um, the second part. And yes, the other calculation is for the NAICS code 72, which is hospitality and restaurants. So that's you know, where you guys would come in. And I'm glad that they did this because there, you know, there's a lot of uh, need out there in the, in that NAICS code. And it sure, it sure, I think hopefully will help out everybody with this process. So I'm glad they did it that way. So I think that's, that's, that's a good part of it. So they threw this in, which I think is actually a very good provision. Uh, I'm not sure what's magical about 25%. I always laugh when they throw out round numbers. There's no math behind 25%. And I said, why not 22? Why not 32? Why not 31? Why not 27.6? You know, they just like these round numbers. So you must show a 25% decrease in gross receipts. And so I have a lot of people asking me, well, Brad, how are we going to, com how are we going to compute that? Well, it's based on a quarter by quarter basis. So I've included for you here a picture for those of you that are on QuickBooks. This is the report that you should under QuickBooks run and the parameters that you run to show you exactly what you've done on a quarter by quarter basis. It shows you the previous year change and it shows it by quarter and it shows it for all of 2020 and it will show you how far down you are. Um, I recently had somebody call me and they say, well, Brad, my net income's down by 25%, but my, my revenue isn't. I'm like, well, that sounds like it's a you spending money problem, um, you know, as opposed to a revenue decrease problem. So, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's very clear, 25% decrease in gross receipts in, a, in one of the quarters. Also, the other way is you could look at your gross receipts tax reports and see what you filed in the state of New Mexico during that time. Uh, for those of you that have, have uh, restaurants in multiple states, obviously you're probably, the banks will probably ask for your other state uh, income tax reports or sales tax reports during that time. So, you know, this is a, uh, that you are need, gonna need to justify and show that you have 25%. Um, this remind, and it's a hard and fast 25%. This reminds me of when I was in, uh, in college and we we're in the orientation class and the orientation person said, all right, if anybody has scored a score of less than 600 on their SAT in math, they need to take remedial math. If not, you could take math 100. And a girl in the front raises her hand. She says, excuse me, I got a 590. Can I take regular math? He goes, that's why you need to go to remedial math to learn that 590 is less than 600. So, uh, one of my clients calls and say, well, I'm down 24 and a half, and it's not 25. Well, how do I get to 25? Well, I, 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 you need to show that you're more than at a 25% decrease in gross receipts. So, you know, if, if I, I doubt any of you, or I, I would doubt, uh, assume that most of you, uh, because of the uh, terrible shutdowns and everything, that you guys are well into uh, less than 25% decrease. So it shouldn't be a problem in the restaurant associations. But uh, just make sure, you know, you have to still prove it. Um, you know, you have to prove that you're down this 25%. So what can we spend it on? It's the same uses as before. We can still spend it on payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent obligations, utility payments. Now, Remember on this, they've changed some of the regulations behind this 
in that it's got to be mortgage interest that you already have. It's only the interest portion and it can't be to a related party. It can't, you, you can't deduct rent paid to your related party. If you, it, but you could deduct if you paid your rent to yourself. So you have operations and you have land. The operations pays the rent over to land. If that land has a mortgage, you could conceivably take the mortgage on that land and um, uh, the mortgage on that land portion and treat that as a covered expense potentially over in the operational side. So, you know, that's a, uh, um, that's certainly a challenge. So then we add that plus what they call this covered operations expenditures. I'll give you a little bit of detail on that in a second, but property damage, it's, it's, it's very interesting how they did this. I'm trying to get my little notes here that are talking about the, the uh, extended uh, extended expenses. So covered operation expenses include such things as business software and cloud computing so that you can continue to operate your, your business during a shutdown. That's the covered operational expenses. It also covers property damage stemming from vandalism or looting due to public disturbances that occurred during 2020 that were not covered by insurance. So this was put in for, um, you know, the, some of the riots and those kind of things that happened during the summer and the late, or, you know, the fall um, of where you had to, uh, you had to, had to repair or, or retool your business. The other one is covered worker protection. So basically this is any capital expenditure to help you comply with health and human services or CDC or OSHA compliance for, for the, uh, the issues with PPP and, and the, excuse me, the issues with COVID-19. So that could, could be you installing a drive-through window facility. Uh, you know, everybody who's putting up the indoor outdoor uh, ventilation filtration systems, physical barriers, um, expansion of your indoor outdoor combined space, on-site or off-site health screening for your employees um, and personal protective equipment for your employees. Uh, it does not include residential real property or tangible property. So you, it can't be you acquiring more space, right? It can't be used for you to go buy more space because you say, well, I can only operate at 25%. So I'm going to go buy a four times size bigger building so that I can have the same amount of volume and the government's going to pay for it. Well, no, that, that's not how that uh, that's not how that works. Uh, one of the questions was, how about propane tanks and gas? I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I, could, I think that I would try to argue that under covered operations and expenditures. This, I, they're forcing me to be outside. Um, I think certainly it's also potentially could be a utility because I think that you, if we were set up differently, you could potentially run a gas line I know this, I'm sorry, I am not a, I don't represent the uh, Natural Gas Association, nor do I know how to dispense gas. But, you know, theoretically, if you had a gas line that ran outside and you theoretically plug that into a gas heater outside, that gas is being used, it's a utility, that is a, a utility. So I think your propane tank and propane gas can be qualified as a utility as well. Um, so that's, that's one question. Let me see, there's a few other questions I think related to this section. Uh, one of the questions was, what if I, you did not operate for one full quarter in 2019? How do you, how do you prove the 25% decrease? That's a great question. It's through any quarter in 2019. So for example, if you didn't operate in Q2 of 2019 and in Q2 of 20, you had zero income, well, that's not a decrease. So you hopefully you had a 25% decrease between Q3 in 2019 and 2020. Um, I think, I believe, no, I don't, uh, I'd have to go look, but my recollection is, is that it still includes businesses. If you weren't in existence in 2019, 
um, I don't believe this still allows you to um, get anything, which is, I think, a flaw in the law. But I will verify that one as well. So there's one question, if we have two LLCs, one is a restaurant and one owns the building that restaurant pays rent to, once again, you can only take the interest portion of that. If the building's fully paid off, you can't use that rent as a allowable expense because it's a related party uh, rent activity. Um, okay, so uh, there's that. There's a question about forgiveness and I'll get to that here in a second. A mobile food trailer. Okay, so one of the questions was, how about a mobile food trailer? Well, that's really interesting. Um, I think that's an ingenious idea. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we're here at 509 South Main in Las Cruces. If you want to swing your mobile food by, uh, there's a 73 people here that would love to, uh, to eat food. <laughs> so that's always good. Um, you know, I don't know that that necessarily would qualify. That's a stretch to get it under covered operations expenditures. But, I mean, it's also... I mean, you have you, drive-through windows are allowed. So um, I think maybe a little bit of a stretch, but with some of the things that they're telling you that you can do and qualify, I really think that this is an opportunity for the restaurants to, I don't want to say reinvent, that sounds very, uh, you know, uh, too much hyper, high, hyperbole. The, uh, it allows you to reinvent your kind of your space. It allows you to say, oh God, should I have a drive-through? Well, that I can use this loan for some of that. You know, should I have an outdoor space that allows us to eat in case we ever get back into this same situation again? You know, should I should I chop up my rooms? Can I have individual rooms as opposed to you know one big room for eating? So there's a lot of different things, and I think that you need to um, to take a look. Um, So yeah, so that's uh, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I tell you what, you know, Andres, I know you have questions about not being there. I'm gonna have to look up the answer on if you you know opened in 19 and and where you're at. But I, gosh, I think that's a really tough tough situation that you're in on that one. Um, so we'll have to take a look. Um, let's see. So yeah, Jeannie, on your question about the uh, is one one's a restaurant, one building is a the other one owns the building. Once again, you can only take the interest portion on the other building, not the rent. The rent is not, not deductible to a related party, but if it is paid to a non-related party, you're gonna be fine on that. So lots of, lots of, lots of interesting things that come along with, with this. So the next question stems from forgiveness. And let's see if I can do this correctly. Let's see. Well, I already screwed it up here. So um, let me drag this up here. So this is, uh, okay. This is the new PPP um, application form. The new and improved and much simplified, and it's, it's, a, it's a joke, uh, it's not super simplified, but here's basically, um, here's the form. You're going you're gonna to go through, it looks very similar to the previous form. Now, if you have not gotten your, your first PPP loan forgiven, I'd very much say go ahead and go get your first PPP loan forgiven and maybe submit that at the same time you're looking to submit this. Um, we've been... Uh, feverishly working for clients to get things forgiven. And I think that uh, it is now that we have clarification on the deductibility and timing of the expenses, I think it's full speed ahead and get this taken care of. You'll see they kind of change this around. Over here, we've got the average monthly payroll and the uh, two and a half times or three and a half for, the, for you guys with the uh, NAICS code 72. The number of employees, including affiliates. So this is everybody that's under this EIN number. Okay, it can't be over 300, 300 people. Um, the purpose of the loan, select all that apply. I don't know about you guys, but in filling this out, I believe that you should check um, at least seven of the eight 
I don't know that for a, from an audit standpoint, it's kind of like in the IRS when we have um, uh, it's kind of like in the IRS when they say, hey, what what method are you other? Um, you know, we really don't like to have information in that line. If you had your first draw number, that's where they put that in there. It should be on your loan documents. And then here, here's the issue is that you have to be able to show the reference quarter and your, and your reduction in, in receipts. Um, question is, is that the number of employees before or after lockdown? Uh, I believe that's the same computation as you had before. So it should be the number of employees that you had prior to lockdown. Um, that's what I believe. So I know that uh, some of there thinks something's not true. I'm not sure what that's not true, but uh, if you could explain further, I'd love to have the chat. Um, and so, you know, I believe that is the, the uh, once again, the, the number you had pre-lockdown. Um, gross receipts taxes, where you, there's, excuse me, the gross receipts, tax, the gross receipts, excuse me, that you're gonna have to show. Um, uh, so you go through there. Applicant ownership, it's very similar, you'll see to the other, to the other piece here. So um, all, all the different questions that they're gonna go ask. So it's a lot of the information that's very, very similar. So it's nothing that's too much different than where you were at before. You understand that you're not committing perjury, that you had a reduction in gross receipts tax relative to the relevant uh, period of time. Uh, for loans more than 150, you have to have a substantiating document to the lender to prove it. Um, for loans 150 or less, the applicant will provide documentation to decline gross receipts tax upon or before seeking loan forgiveness for the second draw upon SBA request. So once again, this is a that's a that's a challenge, right? So you know. Um, you are attesting to this under penalties of perjury. We saw where people weren't using these funds appropriately, like the people who use them to buy Ferraris and Lamborghinis and those types of things. Um, but you know, you're, you are attesting here that you are um, that you are uh, doing that. So just just make sure. And so here it says the applicant received a first draw paycheck protection program loan and before the second loan is dispersed, will have, will have used the full amount of the first loan only for eligible expenses. So if you use the first loan for non-eligible expenses, you're not gonna be able to get, um, you know, you're not able to get all this, uh, get, get this second round. So make sure you're doing that. So let's see. Uh, okay, let's see here. One of the other questions here. Can you use the same payroll numbers used when applying the first time around? I think you're pretty close to using the same numbers because if you use all your 2019 and it's the same computation, I think you're going to have almost the exact same numbers. A lot of our clients, it's the same, it's the same loan amount uh, if, they have, if they have that. You know, so that, that's things you're gonna have to take a look at. So like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge and uh, it's, just, it's just a challenge. Will it hurt our forgiveness if we only have 83 employees and now we have 43? Well, like I said, it's just, it talks about number of employees. You have to justify the, um, that you, you, it may hurt. And like I said, I think that's where it's a challenge for, uh, for the, uh, the restaurant industry. But now, one of the things that I want to make sure is, is clear, and let me get back to that, is the forgiveness piece on the second draw is a lot easier. Okay? The forgiveness piece on the second draw is the limit is the lesser of, so whichever one's smaller, the lesser of your covered expenses or your payroll costs divided by 0.6. Okay, well, that means that whichever one's smaller, that means if you didn't spend 60% of that money on payroll, okay, if you spent more than 60% of that money on payroll, you're fine. It doesn't have a computation 
based on retained employees or anything like that. The forgiveness as it's written in the law is the lesser of covered expenses or payroll cost divided by 0.6. So once again, they've taken out the whole, you have to have the same number of employees, you can't go down from employees. So they took that out on the forgiveness piece. So that, that's, that's really good. Um, I'm look, I was just looking through my notes. The one question about that is that you, if you are not in existence for a full quarter in 2019, you have to show them that you had a loss in revenue that you were actually operating in 20. So what I would do is you'd probably show that first quarter of 20, what your revenue was, or maybe in this case, your December, January, and February revenue. And to show that now in a similar three month period, that you decreased your revenue. So I was just looking through some of the detail in here. And so if you weren't there, you can qualify. So. Um, so I know that's a lot, 48 minutes of me talking about PPP and all those loans. And so I'm happy to answer any questions um, uh, as well. So hopefully Carol, I like I said, try to get through some of these chats uh, one of the questions yeah. is, yeah, first and second get forgiven separately. Yes, they're, they're forgiven separately. You probably need to do the first, probably would get that first one forgiven and then uh, and do the second one as well. So Ed had some questions in the very beginning and I'm trying to get back to those. I found them once and can't find them. I've got them, Carol, okay. if that helps. Okay. Dion, if you, if you don't mind, ask those questions and we'll, if that's okay, can we go on, Brad, to questions now? Sure, absolutely. Okay. So, and I've tried to keep track of the ones that um, he's answered as he goes. From Ed, he asks, is the number of employees on the application per store or a total like round one? My paycheck is used for one company's payroll. Can my K-1 income also be used in a separate partnership to determine the payroll? In 2019, we had 643 employees that could not apply for the EIDL. Today, we only have 457. Can we also apply for EIDL? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer on the EIDL. I think there is that 500, 500 person limitation. So you probably should be okay for the EIDL loan. Um, you're still over the 350, the 300 employee limit. Um, yeah, which probably Brad, have, you probably have multiple locations. So you're probably okay. Um, because if I you have multiple say, locations, you, you get to up to 500. Um, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, you should be fine on the number of employees. But EIDL, like I said, I, I, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm not an expert in EIDL, but I think it's a $500 limit or 500 person limit. So you should be fine. Um, and I think, uh, and we were on a webinar with the National Restaurant Association and that 300 limit is per store, I believe. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Well, like I said, you, the, the issue that you have with that one I hate to be able, but you can thank some of uh, your fellow participants who, you know, were publicly traded companies and I don't want to say ruined it for all of us, but <laughs> they ruined it for all of us on the PPP is is because they they took these loans and they split up their companies in a way that allowed them to get more and they got busted for it. So, you know, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. And so you just got to make sure. The one question I want to, I want to go back to this one. My paycheck is used for one company's payroll. Okay. My, can my K-1 income also be used in a separate partnership to determine payroll? Well, if you're, being, if you're receiving K-1 payroll, then you probably, um, you know, there's that overall limit on people who make over 100000 $8,333 a month. So my thought is as long as your total comp between payroll and the K-1 isn't counted for more than $8,333, you're probably fine uh, to add the two together. So that's... Just a thought. And with the additions of things together from Cindy earlier, she asked for the PPP application, we figure our average monthly payroll times the 2.5 or 3.5 plus the EIDL, all of the EIDL or what goes there? Are they counting the EIDL with the payroll? Okay, so on the second round here, it says that if you use the same lender, you may be able to use the payroll reports that we sent to them before with the 941s. That's probably true. My question is, since we've lost 50% of our employees over 2019, 
if we use those payroll reports, we'll have to pay all those employees on the 941s with it not within 19 in order to get 100% forgiveness. Now, remember, the second one has a simplified computation. The first one, yeah, you're, there's, there's a weird computation there uh, with the employees and all that on that first round. But the second round, remember, is just on using it for the expenses you're supposed to use. It doesn't have a matter of number of employees or who you paid or whatever it is. Um, so just, just remember that. I think you're still going to be better off using your 19 numbers to get a bigger loan and you should have enough expenses. Um, so you should be fine with that. Um, uh, one question was, is there a certain form to apply for PPP forgiveness? How and where do we get, send? Uh, there is a special form to for this forgiveness, which uh, uh, it's out there on the SBA website. Uh, the bank that you are at should send that to you. And so you, the, the bank should, should provide you with that information, so. We missed Neil's question. Could you elaborate on what covered supplier costs are? Sure, so yeah, let me get back to my note here. Covered supplier costs, covered operations expenditures, business operations, and you know, so we talked about business operations, softwares, cloud computing expenses, anything that allowed you to operate differently. So it's, it's a very broad, broad piece there. And I'm trying to get you the exact, exact definition. Okay, covered operational expenditures are payments for any business software or cloud computing services that facilitates business operations, product services, delivery, processing, payment, or tracking to payroll expense. So basically, if you had to buy laptops, if you had to buy um, Zoom, right? If you had to buy Microsoft Teams, if you had to buy QuickBooks to track all this stuff, if you had to buy payroll service, all these expenses are covered operations expenses. And covered supplier costs are expenditures made by an entity to a supplier of goods for the supply of goods that are essential to the operations of the entity at the time at which the expenditure is made and is pursuant to a contract purchase or purchase order. With respect to perishable goods, they have to be in effect before or at any time during the covered period with respect to the covered loan. So what does that mean? That means that you could use covered supplier costs to pay for your food costs. But don't get weird here. It's only for the cost that you're going to have during that covered period. So you can't go buy three years worth of wine. I mean, I don't know, right? Lately, I've been drinking what I feel is like three years worth of wine in a short period. But you can't go stock up for lack of a, a non-technical term in your industry. You can't go stock up with all your food and say, yeah, this was part of my cost. Because it specifically says during the time that the covered period is happening. So you need to make sure it's only during that one that one piece. We we would be lucky to um, be able to stock up with that little little bit of money. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, are there a few more questions, Dion? There are. There is one still from Cindy earlier about whether the EIDL should be counted um, in the form. It says we. The PPP application says that we figure our average monthly payroll times 2.5 or 3.5 plus the EIDL. Is that all of it? Um, what do we do for average payroll if we haven't had payroll since March of 2020? The bars haven't been open at all. And I think we did those cover are, that second portion. I was going to say those are two separate questions. Right. Um, so the first one of whether the EIDL is included. So it's so my understanding is the EIDL in this second one is not included because they, they don't have a line for it this year. It's average monthly payroll times this amount. So that line's not there. So the EIDL doesn't happen on this new PPP application. The old one, yes, it did. Because there's a confusion because you got the, e, the $10,000 EIDL advance grant. So now that's also going to get forgiven. That gets forgiven as part of the PPP. So it's kind of a weird deal that they did there. Okay. Um, and so like I said, average payroll, it's to 2019 payroll. So if you were open in 2019, you're going to be fine. Okay. And could you clarify the time frame they can use to calculate the average monthly payroll? That's from Chris. Twenty. It says 2019 average payroll. So all of 2019. Okay. So 2019, all of your payroll divided by 12. 
Okay, if, if someone has sent in their forgiveness forms and never received any response, should they contact their lender? Yeah, your lender should be really, really heavily involved in this process because they have a vested interest in this thing getting off their books too. So you should really, really talk to them uh, and they should be very, very responsive on this. So yes, talk to your banker, absolutely pester them, pester them, pester them. Make this go away, make those loans go away. Okay, it looks like we have had all of the questions answered um, as we went. So if anyone else has any questions and wants to jump in onto the chat, please do so. Um, from Michael, you said number of employees are pre-lockdown. Does that mean before the first lockdown in March? Yeah, I, I, the, from my understanding is that I, I would, from what I understand, like I said, I may be completely wrong, but my understanding is that number is your, your original pre-lockdown pre, uh, pre number. I know that that's what most of our clients are putting is their number of employees they had at that time. Like I said, right now, now, what, I, what I would tell you is that I don't know that that whatever number you put in there, it doesn't matter anymore as long as the number is less than 300, 300 okay. right? Because there's no computation and no uh, forgiveness based on hiring or not hiring the employees or whatever it happens to be, right? End of the second loan. So, I mean, I, I don't want to say that that number doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter. You could put 25 in that number as long as you don't have more than 300 employees. Um, you know. So will owner's wages be allowed in forgiveness? I think it's the same rules as before. So it's the, um, you know, cannot be more than a hundred and whatever thousand, hundred thousand dollars. So it can't be more than $8,333 in wages. And we have been Facebook living this. We think everybody who's on there watching, they do not seem to have any questions at this time either. Okay. Well, um, thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna do a little commercial here. Number one, and then number two, I'll go ahead and open it up for anybody that wants to talk about anything. Um, and Brad, if you'd stick around just for a few minutes, that'd be great. Um, one thing I want to say is that uh, the reason we got the restaurant, restaurants got 3.5 times payroll, 100% deduction in meals. Um, and, and also um, the 25% was a big deal to the National Restaurant Association. You know, at first they were talking about people had to show a 45% loss. And they're like, you know, sometimes we can show that but not often. And we'd like more people to be able to, you know, 25% is a significant loss. 10%, you know, you could do that one year from the, from one year to the next, but 25% is a, is a good number. And the NRA really fought for us on that. They really fought for the 3.5 for our um, members. And, and the second thing I wanna say is that if you're not a member of the New Mexico Restaurant Association, um, please consider be, becoming a member. Um, if you are a member of the New Mexico Restaurant Association, you're automatically a member of the National Restaurant Association and um, you get you know, the advocacy both at the state level and the national level. And we really appreciate those of you who are members. Um, we appreciate you. You are the reason that we can bring people these webinars. Um, and so I just wanna, I, I wanna say thank you for for those of you who are members and for those of you who aren't, please consider becoming a member. Uh, it's not that expensive. And as a matter of fact, at this point, um, if you can't pay, we'll, we'll um, put you on our membership roles and then we'll let you pay at a later date because uh, we understand the situation that you're in. Um, so any other questions for Brad? Uh, I've got a question here for me, which is what is the liquor license update for this legislative session? I know it's not an NMRA focus, but I hear strong evidence that this, that they will be devalued this session. Um, as a matter of fact, we are asking legislators, you know, let us get through everything we've got to get through right now before you start talking about liquor license, anything except we are pushing um, a, a liquor license proposal that would allow us to sell liquor takeout and um, delivery. So just for your information, that's the only piece of legislation we'll be getting behind this legislative session. 
I have heard there are others that are going to come out, but we've also talked to a lot of those legislators who have said, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and put it out so we can start talking about it, but we won't push it this, this session. No promises, you know, it's a free for all up there. Um, be sure and contact folks and we'll be sure and let you guys know if, if something comes up. Any other questions for Brad and you guys can unmute yourselves if you'd like. Um, I know, uh, Ed, you had mentioned that you thought something was incorrect and I'd like to know what that is before we get off. <laughs> Ed Linderman. You may already be off. Okay. Um, so keep keep your eye out for anything coming out from the New Mexico Restaurant Association. We do have this uh, this campaign out in the cold. Don't leave restaurants out in the cold. Don't leave our employees out in the cold. We need everybody to be sending notes to their legislators that um, that this industry is very important as it is. And uh, so we appreciate everything you guys can do. I hear somebody on. Uh, has unmuted themselves. Go ahead. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Jim Shaw, and I own Hops Brewery. And I was wondering, uh, does a brewery that serves food is that um, is that under the code seventy two? I believe so. Let me. I, I have my little cheat sheet here with code seventy two NAICS code. Let me look up. But I'm I'm pretty darn sure we can, you can make it fit. Okay, and then and then if I didn't get the first round, um, can I apply for the first round now? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't think so. National, uh, I listened to a national uh, webinar for like the Brewers Association, and they they kind of alluded to the fact that that if you didn't get the first round, that you could apply under the first round guidelines. Um, and I'm I I think I, I, I you, think the challenge you have there, I think John, the Jim, the challenge that you've got, there's I believe there's a technical deal where all the PPP loans had to be dispersed and done by like June 30th of 2020 on that first okay. round. So I, I think that you're um, I think that it's uh, it's it's it, that's gonna be tough. Okay, but I can apply for like a second round, even though I didn't get the first round. I believe so. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, so there's not because, because like, and, and, yeah. And the reason I say that is that you know there's um, the second round also includes, for example, I know that it doesn't part of the change the restaurant association, but it allows for farmers using their Schedule F to get the PPP loan with no employees. So that tells me that they're okay with people who didn't get the first one would that would go ahead and get this second one. So. I think you're okay. okay. And when they allude to like the first one, you just put, you just put down zero or you didn't get it or didn't get it. Yeah. None. And a not, yeah. not applicable. Um, okay. I mean, I, I think a brewery falls under code, uh, any ICS code seven, two, two, four, one, zero drinking places. Right. right. Well, we serve food. I mean, we have a full kitchen, um, you know, so it's not like we're, yeah, there's also restaurants and other eating places. So I think you're good there. Uh, you're okay. definitely not a snack and non-alcoholic beverage place. So, right. And we're happy no. for that, by the way. Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I appreciate your time and it's very informative and uh, thanks again. No problem. My pleasure. We had one final one, Brad, that when is the first day that the PPP2 application can be submitted? Uh, uh, Monday, the 11th. So two days ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? So again, everybody, um, you know, you're welcome to email me at executive at nmrestaurants.org if you have questions while you're going through this. But also remember that it really is your banker who is going to be your, you know, the, the person shepherding this loan through the government. And so, you know, rely on your banker. I know that, uh, that previously we had had some problems with bankers um, not or banks not being uh, part of the PPP loans. Brad, do you want to talk about that a second? Um, and yes, yeah, absolutely. So where you're going to have your best luck and like shame, shameless plug for community banks, but I am a board director on a community bank, but you will have your better luck at your community banks 
Um, the big money center banks such as B of A, uh, Wells Fargo, um, U.S. Bank, they're limited by the federal government on what certain amount of SBA and different loans they can do. And so they really um, are limited in what they can do to help. Uh, and so that's where I think that most of our clients that got our loans, I think we had $65 million worth of loans from our clients, $70 million worth of loans our clients did. And they were uh, all but two, I think, were at, at community banks. And got a lot more support than at some of the national banks. And I'm not, I'm not taking a shot. It's just the facts. They, they, they can't do some of these loans and they're not as helpful um, when, when some of that time comes, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of community banks. So I would, I would use your, your, your local community banks too. Wonderful. Um, and we have a, a hand up, Kathy Diaz, you want to unmute yourself? I just wanted to clarify what I learned from my banker when, um, where we got our first PPP loan and I called him about this and he said, they've been told that the first round starting on Monday was for, they were limiting that to people who had not gotten a first round of PPP and starting at the community banks, uh, smaller ones. And they wanted to do that so that they gave, because those banks they said were left out a lot. You know, they were challenged to get loan packages in uh, the first time. So they wanted to give them an opportunity and so um, the larger community banks, and I guess mine falls in a middle range on that, uh, will be have it for second round people. The app will be taken uh, by the 18th. And that's apparently the rule, not just for my bank, but that was the stepping in of this application process. So it would favor smaller businesses and businesses that hadn't um, gone through the first process and the smaller banks. Go ahead. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Jeanette, you're unmuted. I have a question about the what you need to use for documentation for the income and uh, also for your payroll. Does that depend on what the banker wants or? Um, well, yeah, there, so there's a little bit of rules that the bankers have and so what it makes them comfortable, but I think you're probably uh, the conversation I had with the bank today was they wanted to see gross receipts tax reports for the quarter, um, comparing those two to document your 25% decrease uh, or uh, QuickBooks or some type of uh, uh, ERB system that uh, would show your uh, uh, revenue during that time. And so you're going to have to substantiate it. So it's very, th think, you got to think IRS, right? We're doing government agencies. What would the mm -hmm. IRS, what would, what, what would you be okay seeing in order to make that to justification. A profit and loss statement would be okay or? Well, I think that it probably is a good start, um, but I know a lot of times bankers are, are suspect with in-house statements because those can tend to be manipulated a little bit. Um, so I would probably, once again, back my, back my in-house statement up with a, my gross receipts tax reports. Gross receipts, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so a question from Joe, is it true that we have to have an account at the bank prior to, uh, the, prior to COVID to get a loan? My bank was not really responsive. Um, that's not true. I know that, like I said, I mean, once again, bank board director, we did a lot of loans at the bank I was at uh, for people who were not customers before. And most of them were people who were at the large money center banks that uh, couldn't get their loans. And so um, that's not true. Uh, it could just be that those loan those so you got to understand the bank not all banks want to make these loans right not all bank because this does this does put a strain on banks capitals capital and so not all banks want to necessarily make these loans and so if, if your bank is pushing back or telling you that they can't do it you might want to consider looking at a different bank so all right any more questions i don't want to go too much longer um we only had bread for an hour so um, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, please, you know, keep in touch. I really do like hearing from you. So um, don't hesitate to email me. My email again is executive at nmrestaurants.org. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Brad. I really appreciate you answering these questions and, and helping us out with this. It's Bye, my pleasure. Everybody. Anybody can reach out anytime. Please feel free. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.